Good morning. All right. So today we're continuing in our, our series called Sent. I've been walking through the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, uh, and that's in the New Testament. And it's been a fun series so far. We've, we've gone through the first five chapters. And just in that first five chapters, we've seen Jesus promise uh, to empower his people to take on this mission of, of taking the gospel around the world. And then just in Acts 2, 10 days later, how the, the promise comes true as the Holy Spirit falls and they're baptized and speaking in other tongues. There's fire, all sorts of crazy stuff, and the mission launches. And then over the next few chapters, as we've gone up to chapter 5, we've seen this, the church start to, to grow and, and things start to happen. And, and it's you know, all kind of in, in the midst of this unstoppable mission, this unstoppable gospel that's starting to flourish amongst the people there in Jerusalem. And that's kind of where we've been and what we've been going through uh, but one thing that's been consistent, I think, so far as we've looked at uh, the story, is that persecution is part of the life of the church. That if we're choosing to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, we're choosing to follow the mission, that that's, that's going to come with opposition. That's, that's just part, part of the program. It's part of the thing. But nevertheless, we see that the church is continuing to grow. It's continuing to move forward. In fact, Acts 5 ends this way. I've got this on the screen for you. Day after day. And the temple courts and from house to house and never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So we see things that are moving forward in the midst of opposition and persecution. Things are good. Life is good. And you know, this is God's church, right? And it would make sense that things are going well, that things are going good. But what we're going to look at today, uh, what we're going to dig into this morning is that following God's mission, um, it doesn't only lead to persecution, external persecution but it can also produce internal conflict. And I know conflict is a word that's a fun word. And for a lot of us, we, we hear the word conflict and it's like, ooh, I, I, I hate conflict. Is anybody else with me? I hate conflict. Yeah, but not all conflict is bad, right? I mean, if you've ever been to like the donut, you know, go to the and Krispy Kreme, right? And, there, and there, there's all the donuts before you and you have to pick one, right? And there's this conflict inside of you of like, which one do I go with? If I go with that, we're missing out on this. You see? So like, conflict isn't always, always a bad thing. Sometimes conflict is a good thing. But also, sometimes the, it's, it's the absence of conflict that's a bad thing. So not only is conflict not always a bad thing, but sometimes when there isn't conflict, that can be a bad thing. Maybe you've grown up in a family like that, where we just didn't talk about stuff. It just was sort of pushed under the rug. But if we want to see God's mission move forward, it's going to lead us to places that are uncomfortable. And in those places that are uncomfortable, conflict can creep in. And what's important for us to remember, what we're going to look at this morning, and it's our big idea is this, is that God uses conflict to clarify the mission. God uses conflict to clarify the mission. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 6 this morning. If you want to use one of the chair Bibles in the seats in front of you, that's on page 762. And as we say every week, if you're, if you're new to Creekside, if you don't have a Bible of your own, you're welcome to take that Bible home is our gift to you today. We love giving out Bibles. But you can also follow along in the Creekside Church app if you haven't downloaded that on your mobile device. I would encourage you to do that. There's lots of resources in there and goodies in there for you. But also, I've got it here on the screens behind me. So let's start reading Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay, let's stop there for a second. I want to make something clear right up front. You probably know this, but I just want to, I just want to for the sake of clarification. We see, we see the church, right? This is God's church. Things are going well. Things are growing. But in the midst of all of that, there's conflict. There's conflict. And so I just want you to know this up front, is that there is no perfect church. Not even this church, right? This is God birthed this thing, and then right here we see conflict, there's things happening, there's persecution, there's conflict. And so if you are looking for the perfect church, maybe you are, I don't know, maybe that's why you came here, thinking somehow, you know, the blue signs maybe pulled you in, like, now this, this place seems to have it together, maybe this is a perfect church. There is no perfect church. And if you find one, right, the old adage is, is if you find it, don't join it, right? Because then what? You'd ruin it, right? <laughs> there is... There's no perfect church. So let me just kind of help us understand what, what's going on here in this situation. Well, back in Acts 4, uh, we read about how the, the, the followers of Jesus were, were displaying this radical generosity. 
They were selling possessions. They were selling property in order to help those who were in places of great need. And they were bringing these things to the apostles who would distribute them as the needs were, were presented. And now we fast forward to Acts 6, and that's still in place, but we're finding out that not everybody is kind of getting equal distribution of, of some of these things. There's a certain group of widows that were being overlooked in the distribution of food. And just so you know, overlooked in the NIV, which is a translation we're reading from, is a really nice way. In other translations, it says discrimination, which is a pretty big word. So there, there's, there's an issue here involving widows, and widows were uh, a, a, you know, a, a group of people back then that had no financial standing on their own. They would rely on extended family. They would rely on the family of God to meet their needs. And so we have this, this overlooked group, group of widows that are in a really difficult situation. And why were they being overlooked? This is where it gets a little stickier. So we talk about Hellenistic and Hebraic. Those are big words to say. Hellenistic means that they were Jews that spoke Greek, which was a common language around the known world outside of Israel. So these were Jews that had been scattered, that had come back, they were here, maybe they, they came back for Pentecost, they were, they were encountered with the gospel, they were saved, they were baptized, now they're part of the church. And so we have this group of people that, that speaks this language, but then within Israel, there's the Hebraic Jews that speak Aramaic, that speak the common language. And there's this, there's this dissonance between these two groups, and, and the ones that spoke the more common language were getting preferential treatment. Okay, Eesh. right? That sounds like a bit of a sticky situation. Um, and and, and as, diffi as difficult as that sounds, there are some good things that are happening here. There's some good things in the midst of that. Is what we see is that the, the church, even at this early age, is, is multicultural, right? There's all these different cultures represented. And anytime you get a bunch of cultures, a bunch of backgrounds together, sometimes that's going to be hard to mesh things, right? We worship the same God, but we speak a different language. We have different cultural backgrounds. So that, that causes things sometimes are difficult to mesh. And does that sound similar to, to the world that we live in today, right? We live in a city that is like a melting pot of culture. And if, you, if you're like, you know, if, you, if, you, if that is something you're not sure about, just drive up and down 99 when you go out to look for lunch today, and you're going to come across any and every type of culture. We live in this very diverse place. In fact, I was looking statistically, they say about a third of people that live in Linwood, just the city of Linwood, English is not their first language. So we live in a very diverse place, a very multicultural place. But then on top of that, within the church today, we're also multi-generational. I don't know if you were in the service last week. We had eight people get baptized over both services. It was awesome. It was such a fun service. We had everybody, the kids, everybody was in the room. And if you were there, you would notice we, we have a lot of different generations represented in our church, right? Where we kind of spread the gamut of ages and generations. And different generations are going to talk different. They're going to look different. They're going to dress different. They're going to say things in a different way. And sometimes it can seem foreign to us. It can seem different. It's outside of what we're used to. So, so in this passage, we see this vulnerable group of people in great need that are being overlooked. And this wasn't something that was happening out, out in the world, out there. No, this was happening in the church. This was happening among the people that professed to follow Jesus. So this, this is a messy, messy situation. And so I, I wanted to take a second and pull this forward to today. And I've got a question I want to ask us. Is do you and I consider the needs of others in the family of God? Do you and I consider needs of others in the family of God? There, there are needs and opportunities for generosity that exist right here at Creekside. And the question is, do we see it? Do we notice? On Sundays, we can, be, we can be in such a hurry. And I don't know what your Sunday was like this morning. And, I, and if this is you, I'm not pointing you out, okay? I didn't see you. This is just the Holy Spirit working on your heart. But if you, if you, you know, you get to church and you come in a side door, you grab your coffee and you come in just in time for service and you sit down and you're there for service, but as soon as we're done, you're, you're right back out the side door, back onto your week, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity, you, you can be so busy that you miss opportunities to connect, opportunities to notice things around you. If we never take time to sit down, to slow down, to, to see other people, to have conversations, as we say this every week, with someone you did not ride here with, if we miss that, we're missing opportunities for community, for ministry, for generosity. And so I, I just want to challenge us as a church. 
Let's not be in such a hurry that we miss opportunities around us to, to take care of each other, to bless each other, to, to, to connect with people that look different than you, that dress different than you, that sit in a different section than you. Maybe instead of rushing out to your car today, maybe take a second and meander across the room. Try out a different section. Talk to someone who isn't kind of right there around you. Go out a different door than you came in. And take an opportunity just to, just to notice people around you. And, and just so you know, and I'm sure you know this, but this isn't the only service that we have. The 930 is on our only service. We have an 1115 that happens after this. We also have during the week, or, or we have a Sunday night service on a Bitter Lake at, at 5 o'clock. We also have a Tuesday night service at Mali Terrace at 5 o'clock. Both of those are our neighborhood tables. And I'll tell you, there are lots of opportunities to connect with people that are different than you. People that are in different situations, that come from different backgrounds, that look, talk, and, and act differently than you do. And so I would encourage you, if you've yet to, to experience one of our neighborhood tables, if you want to talk about overlooked groups of people in our, in our community, the elderly and the homeless are two of those groups. And specifically Bitter Lake, those are the, the main groups we have at that service. So I would encourage you, if that is something you've yet to experience, on your Discover card, you can check that says, join a neighborhood table ministry team. Or just write neighborhood table on your Discover card, and we will connect you more with that opportunity. But there are opportunities around us to see needs, to notice needs. And are you and I taking the time to notice those things? So let's look here. How do the, the disciples handle? How do they respond to this situation, this complaint? Let's keep reading in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. It says, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. What is so amazing in this story, in this account, is that the, the, that the apostles, the leaders of the church, didn't just sort of skip over this. They didn't ignore it. They didn't sweep it under the rug. They said, no, we're going to tackle this head on. We're going we're to tackle this together as the church. And in fact, what's interesting is this is the last time in the book of Acts, that we're going to see the 12 kind of original apostles of Jesus. This is the last time they're going to be mentioned together. From here, it's going to scatter, it's going to grow, and other leaders are going to be a part of this thing. And what, what these church leaders recognize is that this need was bigger than they could handle on their own. This is getting bigger than what they could handle. The church is growing. It's, it's going beyond the reach of these 12 men. Right back in Acts 4, they, the apostles were the ones receiving this stuff and the ones distributing this stuff. And so... The need was outgrowing their ability to maintain it. So this brought things to a tipping point. And remember, as we said, our big idea, God uses conflict to clarify the mission. See, this is, it's not a small issue. This is a big deal. If this isn't handled well, this could split the church. This could divide. This could stop what God was wanting to do. And we know this is something that the apostles were being asked to fix because in verse 2, they said this, it, is, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. So this is something that was being suggested to them. And their answer, the first time I read this, seems a bit harsh, right? Like, we don't have time to wait on tables. We're preaching the word of God. We don't have time for that stuff. That's kind of how it can read, but that's not at all, because these were the guys that were doing this before. What they're saying is, we, we just can't capacity-wise continue to do all the things. We can't continue to do all this stuff. And this points to another potential threat. Not only could this lead to a divided church if something wasn't done, but also it could be solved the wrong way. And what I mean by that was the suggestion was the apostles should maybe spend some more time waiting on tables and less time preaching the word of God. They could choose to do that. If they, they could choose to, to follow that. And that was sort of the suggestion that was being made to them. But this, this, is a, this would be another threat to the, to the ministry, if, if the word of God was, was being diminished in order to serve tables. And, and if we go back to Acts 1.8, we go back to what the mission is, like Jesus said that we're going to be empowered to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Witnesses. 
Okay, that, that's the primary part of the mission is sharing the gospel. This was an important thing that they were called to do. And so, so how do they sort of reconcile this? And in, in, in conflict, uh, it's really easy to, to slip into being, if you're especially like me, if you hate conflict, and I know there are others in the room, I saw you waving your hands like, oh yeah, that's me all, all day long. It's easy for us to slip into this mode of being a peacekeeper and not a peacemaker. You say, what's the difference? And there's a difference between the two. I've got it here on the screen. The difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacekeeping pursues comfort at all costs. Whatever I have to do just to, just to make things all right, to make things comfortable, to make things okay, that's what I'm going to do. Peacemaking pursues reconciliation at the cost of comfort. Peacemaking says, I, I, I'm going to put reconciliation as the most important thing, even if it costs my comfort. If the disciples were to pursue peacekeeping, it may have led them to committing more time to waiting on tables and less opportunity for the ministry of the word. That would have been a peacekeeping approach, but they chose to be peacemakers. They said, listen, this, this is, there's got to be a better way than this. This is not going to happen. This, this can't work. There has to be a better way than what we're doing now. And so what was the solution that they proposed? Let's look at it again in Acts 6, 3, and 4. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the Word. Okay, I want you to catch this. This was not an either-or solution. It wasn't a, well, we just need to spend more time on the ministry of the Word and, you know, the table thing, if we have time, great. It was not an either-or solution. It was a both and solution. It was a both these things are critical to the mission. We need to find a way to do all this. It was time to empower more leaders within the church. This would free up the apostles to do what they knew Jesus had called them to do while also inviting others to meet an important need. And this is something we've said throughout this series, but God longs to empower people for the mission. God longs to empower people for the mission. If, if God's mission is going to move forward then it had to move beyond the 12 apostles. And it still has to. If it was still about those 12 men, they're dead. Right? This thing would have not gone far if it would have ended with those 12. It has to go beyond that. We have to empower more people for the mission. And if we're not careful, we can fall into the trap of seeing God's mission as an either-or proposition. It's either focused on works. right? We, we see here that the ministry to widows, a table ministry, or is it word? Is it, is it preaching the word of God? Is it this, this focus on witnessing? Is it either or? But, but what the apostles are telling us is, what if it's both? What if both those things are critical to the mission? What if it's not either or? What if it's both? The early church wasn't willing to compromise on either of these. It's important that we, that we be ministers of God's word, that we share Jesus, what Jesus has done in our hearts and our lives. But it's also important we live this out in our daily lives. Obedience to God's word should lead us to action. It should lead us to action. And if we're going to consider a both and solution, it's going to require more leaders. And they give us here two qualifications for those that would serve in this ministry to widows. And I've got them here on the screen. The qualifications for leadership are one, full of God's spirit. And then two, full of wisdom. That was the two things that they said. This is, this is sort of the basics of what we require for, for serving in this role. It's just these two things. And what's interesting to me is what is not on that list. There was no, you know, required experience in handling food, like, you know, distributing food to mass amounts of people. Like, that wasn't a requirement for people to serve in this role. Because that would make a lot of sense, right? People that had a background in this, people that, you know, maybe have done this before in other, in other ways, in other businesses or whatever, like someone who has a knack for this. Like, that would be the perfect person to empower for this role. But that's not what we see here. It was full of God's spirit, full of wisdom. And we can be tempted to see neglected needs or opportunities and think, someone qualified should handle that. That's some of the most dangerous words we could ever say. Someone should, someone should take care of that. Implying that it's not me, it's somebody else. But if you notice it, maybe there's a reason. Maybe there's a reason it's on your radar. Maybe there's a reason why you notice. You don't have to have experience in an area to help. If you are filled with God's spirit and are pursuing his leading in your life, what they say here is, listen, you're qualified. That's it. If you're, if you're full of God's spirit and you're following after his leading in your life, you're good to go. And I love what our guest speaker shared two weeks ago when he was walking through Acts 5, this sort of the secret ingredient 
of the early church. It wasn't that they had this master plan or this great uh, organization that, that caused the gospel to be unstoppable. It was the Holy Spirit. And if we're consistently seeking the empowerment of God's Spirit, you have, you have everything you need to partner in God's mission. That's, that's it. That's all we need. And I know we've talked about this quite a bit, being filled with God's Spirit. And I, I, just, I don't want to just assume that, I, that you understand what I'm talking about. I want to make sure we drill down a bit and understand what does it mean to be filled with God's Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means that our lives are directed by God's Spirit, that we're sensitive to His leading in our lives. But it also means that we are full of God's power and enablement. And is that something we still need today? Is the mission still going today? Yeah. Yeah, this is something that we still need today. Is it required that I be filled with the Spirit of God to serve on a ministry team as we're talking about here? No, not necessarily. You're not a second-class citizen. If you've not spoken in tongues or been baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives as believers. The moment even leading us up to salvation, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. That, that's a part of it. But, but what we're talking about here is, is there's more. There's more. So we see in Acts, right? These were followers of Jesus, but there was more that enabled them to do what God had called them to do, to enable them to live out the mission. And it's the difference, I like to use this example, it's the difference of using a screwdriver and a power drill. They both, both will get the job done. But one is going to be more effective in that process. And if we want to just take an example from Scripture as we've Look at the book of Acts. Look at Peter. Poor guy. I mean, he, he gets a really bad rap because we look at the Gospels when he was called by Jesus and following Jesus, and, and he was a knucklehead, right? He couldn't keep his foot out of his mouth. He's tripping over himself, saying one thing, doing another. We just see a guy that's just unsteady, that's sort of back and forth. But we see Peter in Acts 2, empowered, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and suddenly he's a different, he's a different person. He's speaking to crowds of thousands. People are being saved. He's leading this church. He's, he's a part of what God is doing. He's standing trial before uh, the leaders, and he's baffling them with, with just his authority. There's a difference. There's something that happened to him. It was the empowerment of the Spirit. And so what I want to encourage us to do on the Discover Card, there's an exit. This is pray for empowerment for the mission. I, I believe this thing is so much bigger than us. That God is calling us and it's something that, that's, that, that is, that is going to change the world if, if we will partner with him in it. He's calling us into his mission. And if we're going to do that, wouldn't we want all that he's promised us? That's what we see in Acts 1 8, right? This promise of power for the mission. He promised we would receive power. That's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if you were here last week and you saw us baptizing people in water, all right, there's a sense that they go down in the water. They're sort of, they're completely covered in and they're, they're overall just in, in the water, right? It's, it's, it's consumed them completely. And that's the same idea with baptism and, and the Holy Spirit, is that the Holy Spirit has consumed our lives. He's consumed us completely. He has every part of us. His power is, is all over us. And, that, and that's what he desires for us. And, and, and I, I recognize that, that many of us may not have been in a church setting where that kind of thing was taught. Or maybe it was there, but it wasn't explained well. And maybe there's, there's fear, maybe there's conflict at, at the idea of, of baptism in the Holy, Holy Spirit, the, the idea of speaking in tongues. But I want you to know it's not meant to make you weird. It's, ma- it's meant to make you effective for God's mission. It's meant to make you effective for God's mission. So I want to encourage us on this next step. This is a long way to get back to the next step. But would we consider, would we begin to pray for the Holy Spirit to empower us? We pray for all that God wants for our lives. In the app, as well as on your learning notes, there is a prayer that if you're looking like, how do I even start to even talk and have this conversation with God? There's language there on how you can even start to pray for that kind of thing. Pray that God would empower you, fill you with the Holy Spirit. And if you say, you know, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I'm kind of here, I'm exploring this, I'm kicking the tires of faith, and this just kind of seems beyond where I'm at. Here's what I would invite you to pray. I would invite you still to check that next step, but would you pray for the desire, say, God, would you, would you, would you give me a desire for, for all that you have for me? God, would you give me a desire for more of you? Because God, if it's something from you, I want that. I trust that. And so wherever you're at on that spectrum, would you check that next step? Pray for empowerment for the mission. 
And maybe you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe that, that's something that you've experienced in your life. Well, we don't see that's just a one-time occurrence in the book of Acts. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us every day to do what he's called us to do, to be on the mission with him. So would you check the next step, pray for empowerment for the mission. So the apostles' solution was to appoint seven men full of the spirit and wisdom. But there was something else that was unique about these men. And I, didn't, I had never noticed it before until I did some study on this passage. But did you notice their names? You probably didn't even catch this because I did. But the seven men that were chosen to carry this ministry all had Greek names. They all had Greek names, meaning that, or Hellenistic names to, to fit in with the passage. So these were all men who were connected to the need, understood the need, were a part of that group. They, they were connected in it. And they, they were the ones that were chosen. They were, they were elected to lead. They would have been connected to the need and they brought a new perspective to the leadership of the church. So these, these were men that were a part of, connected to this need. And are there areas of opportunity you see at Creekside? Areas of conflict for you? Things that you see around and say, man, someone should do something about that. Or man, that, that really frustrates me that this isn't happening. Well, I want you to know God uses conflict to clarify the mission and your calling. Maybe the things that frustrate you the things that you're, you're passionate about that you wish somebody would do something about, maybe God is wanting you to step into that. Maybe that's, that's on your heart for a reason. How might the Spirit be leading you to meet the need? Because I believe God's Spirit has equipped His church with everything we need. God has given this church everything we need to do what He's called us to do. I believe that. And now Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ. And each of you is a part of of it. We are the body of Christ, and each of us has a part to play. We're a part of this thing. This is not, it's not one person or another, and, and you know, we, we all get to be in this, and God has uniquely gifted and called us, and, and things that we see, and things we're passionate about, things that stir our hearts, that God longs for us to step into. And I would encourage you, this week on your Discover card, we memorize scripture every week. I would encourage you to memorize this verse. It's super easy to memorize. But this is something, just would you pray and just sort of marinate and think about this verse and, and how might God be calling you to be a part of the church? How might he be calling you to serve, to be in, to be in the game and get off the sideline if you weren't serving somewhere? Or if there are needs you're seeing, how might God be calling you to meet those needs? And that leads right into this other next step I want to point out. is to serve God's mission by. What are the needs that you see? What are the things that, that you're conflicted about as you say, man, I wish somebody would do something about that? And this isn't like a general thing, but specifically, what are injustices? What are things that you see that you know that God is calling us to do something about it? Now, this isn't a chance for you to complain, okay? If you're just going to complain on here about something, we're probably not going to listen to it. But if there are real things that you see, man, I... I this, this is something, why, why isn't anybody as passionate about this as I am? Why isn't anybody stepping in and, and meeting this need? Would you, would you check that serve God's mission by and then put in whatever that is? And as I've been saying, just so you know, if, if it's something that's on your heart, maybe it's there for a reason. Maybe this is something God is calling you to step into. God is calling you to help meet the need. So if that is something you, you see, you want to, I would encourage you to check that and write that in on your Discover card. So what was the result of them tackling uh, this need head on, this, this, this complaint head on? What was the result? This is, this is my favorite part of the whole story. Let's finish Acts chapter 6, verse 7. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in, in, uh, in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I love that it says the church grew rapidly. Like this isn't, you know, it was like a slow, steady growth. No, this was a rapid growth. It doesn't say, you know, then things were better. They, they got along. Everything sort of calmed down. That's not what we see here. It says, no, the church grew rapidly, which tells me this. This was kingdom building. This was mission critical work. Pursuing unity in the church, wrestling with conflict was something that was, that was vital to the growth, to the effectiveness of God's church. When we choose to pursue unity in this place, when we allow God's Spirit to empower us to tackle the needs we see around us, the Word of God spreads. And the wave brings in more followers 
of Jesus. And Luke points out, for the first time in this verse, the author here, Luke, says that even priests who, who at one time were, were opposing the apostles, were at one time were the ones standing on the other side accusing the, the apostles are now joining in. They're now coming to faith in Jesus as they're seeing this thing grow. We're seeing this thing move forward. It's now reaching those who are at one point opposing it. And the last thing about conflict is conflict clarifies God's mission to rescue us. Conflict clarifies God's mission to rescue us. And one of my favorite verses, and this is again the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, he says that while we were, enemy, while we were his enemies, Jesus died for us. You see, within us, the sin within us creates this conflict between us and God. And if you aren't following Jesus, you, you get it. There's something that's at war inside of you. There's a sense inside of you that, not, that everything's not right. No matter how much you achieve, no matter how much you pursue, that something is missing. Something is at work against you, and you are never satisfied. You never feel like you, you've reached it because there's something missing. And there's this conflict between what, what God wants for your life and, and then what, what you, what your sin nature wants for your life. And Jesus, in the midst of that, seeing the conflict, the brokenness that we were in, knowing we could not save ourselves, saved us for us. He died on the cross and rose again so that we could be made right. We could be brought into right relationship with God. We could have peace with God. And if today you recognize that there is a struggle, there is a war within you, and you recognize that you are far from God, you do not have to stay there. He's inviting you to come close. He's inviting you into relationship with him. And it starts as you say, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, would you rescue me? And I know that's a prayer that Jesus answers every time. And on your Discover card, there's a next step that says become a follower of Jesus Christ. If that is you, would you check that next step? And we'd love to pray for you, and I'd love to send you an email with some encouragement and next steps this week of what it means to follow Jesus. I want to pray, and I want to pray specifically for us, for empowerment, but also that we would pursue the opportunities that Jesus has placed in our path, things that he's given us passion for. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. That we have these examples of what it looks like to, to walk through conflict and how conflict isn't a bad thing. Conflict actually helps us clarify the mission. And Lord, I just want to pray for areas that we see around us, things that we see in this church, we, we see amongst as followers of Jesus that, that seems out of place, it seems like it's not right, it seems like it's, it's missing. There are things that just frustrate us, the things that, that just churn within us, like, man, I just wish somebody would be passionate about this the way I am. That God, maybe you're stirring our heart to, to step into the game, to step into serving you in that way. Jesus, would you help us to get over ourselves? Instead of asking, would someone qualified take care of us and say, Jesus, would you use me? Would we begin to pray that way? Jesus, would you use me? And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you long and you have made a way for us to be empowered for the mission. The baptism in, in the Holy Spirit is not something that's meant to make us weird. It's meant to make us effective for the mission to give us power to see, Jesus, your name lifted high, to be witnesses to your gospel, to be witnesses of your grace and your love. And Lord, Lord, for those today that have been baptized in your spirit, I pray would you baptize them again? Would you fill them with your spirit? Lord, for those today that, that have yet to experience that, I say, Jesus, I want all that you have for my life. Lord, I pray as they begin to pursue you, something as simple as the prayer that we've placed in the resources the Holy Spirit, would you provide? Would you empower them? Would you fill them with your love and your presence and your power? And for those that are, that are distant, that say, I, I don't even know if I can trust this. I don't even know what to do with this. Holy Spirit, I just pray even now that their hearts would begin to turn in a way that says, God, I just help me desire you more. Would they begin to pray that? God, I just help me to desire you more. And just, Jesus, I thank you, you answer those prayers. And for those today that are far, that are longing to come close, that are longing to have the conflict with you resolved, to, to be brought into right relationship, Jesus, I, I ask right now, would you fill them? Would you 
would they know your love in a new way? Would you give them a heart that beats for you? And Lord, we just thank you that you invited us into this mission as a church and as individuals. And Lord, we want to be effective for you. So God, we, would we pursue all that you have for us? In Jesus' name, amen.